Seeking a university degree is more exciting than going to high school, partly because it's not required. <laughs> the next thing I think you should know as a teacher is that you will outlast the bad administrators. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, Please. Uh, ju just for the record, I want to say, we do not have any bad administrators here now. <laughs> In fact, at this university, it's possible we have never had any bad administrators. <laughs> but I have heard stories from other places. <laughs> and, and, and please do not take my comments here as an effort to divide faculty from administration. We must all work well together, and I think we do. The thing is that administrators don't stay in the same position very long, and so as a teacher, if you get a bad one, they will soon leave. I recall someone's collecting statistics and reporting an average length of service of two to three years for deans, three to five years for vice presidents, five to 10 years for presidents. I don't know the accuracy of these numbers, but they seem to match my experience. I do know that the decisions of deans and vice presidents are so important, and we all need to be interested in seeing the best possible people in these positions. Their actions materially affect how well our departments function and how we get to do our jobs. However, faculty need to make sure that our fundamental goals are rooted in principles that are independent of whatever set of administrators exist at a given time. Again, I stress this is not an attack on administrators. And someday I'll give a talk on what aging administrators should know. <laughs> the next thing I think a teacher, an aging teacher should know is that students will change on you. Their attitudes and behaviors change as time passes. I suppose I was a teacher for almost a quarter of a century before a student ever left in the middle of one of my classes. Now it happens in every class, usually every semester. I try not to let it happen more than once. I usually try to gently explain that mathematics may be difficult, but good manners are easy. <laughs> they, they, they're good, they respond that it was this time a, a very necessary trip to the restroom or an expedition to care for a nose. Well, this, this just makes me feel old. Uh, are our bladders now smaller? Our noses, are our noses less capacious than just a few years ago? Uh, when, when you can witness the evolution of your own species, it makes a person feel old. Now, in, in dealing with these changes, it helps me to realize that there are 100 million more people in this country than when I was a college student. Uh, I recall in 1967, when the population of the United States passed the 200 million mark, uh, President Lyndon Johnson declared he was certain that it was one of his grandchildren that put us over. Uh, I believe it was in 2007 that this country grew to over 300 million people. And that year there were probably several politicians who denied putting us over. <laughs> uh, so, so we have, uh, so we have 100 million more people here in just 40 years. Everything is more crowded, the roads, the malls, the classrooms. Uh, and, and just at a time when proportionally we need each person to make less noise, they, they all make more. Uh, as a mathematician, I know how to measure 100 million. Uh, there are 100 million more people here now than when I was in school. And, and, and most of them play music I don't like. <laughs> now that was not the case this morning and I want to publicly thank the chorale. The performance was wonderful, thank you. Maybe in this setting, people behave differently. After all, 
How did college students behave when I was one back in the 1960s? They were boycotting classes, shutting down buildings, and sometimes burning buildings. These sudden shifts in behavior are always perplexing. But again, I must try to put myself in the position of the student to understand. Another way that students change is in the way that they respond to your teaching. Aging teachers had better know this. Uh, just as one, there are many ways, but just as one example, uh, students change in the way they understand your illustrations. We all like to give examples and refer to notable figures or celebrities like Michael Jordan or Madonna. But in giving these examples, you must be careful to keep your illusions current. In fact, it's probably time to change those to LeBron James and Lady Gaga. <laughs> uh, but it is disappointing to someone of my generation to realize that my students do not know who Roy Rogers is. I can no longer use how fast he's traveling on trigger to illustrate any principal's emotion. <laughs> Staying current is difficult. Uh, with developing technology, more people can be placed in the public eye. There are diverse groups in your classes, all with their own personalities and stars. Celebrities just don't last very long. The list gets revised completely every few years. They're constantly being replaced and disgraced, repackaged, or promoted into obscurity. Well, you, you'd think the whole Hollywood system was run by a bunch of deans and vice presidents. <laughs> anyway, the point is that when we give examples and make allusions, we must remain current. Putting ourselves in the place of the students, we need to make references they can identify. The next thing I think a teacher should know is to wear appropriate clothing. Now, now please, please don't be puzzled by this. Being a university professor requires effort. It's, it's not just an excuse to dress in rumple clothes that don't match. <laughs> uh, over, over the years, I've found it very helpful uh, to use articles of clothing to illustrate many of the principles found in mathematics. For example, if you wish to teach the product rule of counting, you can say, I have five different shirts, and three pairs of pants, and two pairs of shoes. How many different outfits can I wear? Well, you just multiply. Five times three times two is 30. You have 30 different outfits. And, and most of them won't match. <laughs> uh, uh, I've, I've used my belt to illustrate geometric properties of curves. Or if I'm providing instruction in logic, and I wish to explain compound propositions, I can say, I'm wearing a red shirt or brown pants. I can say, I'm wearing a goofy gown and a ridiculous hat. <laughs> uh, but it, it's often useful to reference your clothes to demonstrate principles of learning. Why, well, if I were a nudist, I wouldn't make a good teacher at all. <laughs> uh, 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 now, please don't, don't misunderstand. I, I'm not opposed to nudist teaching. <laughs> I, I'm just not aware of any doing it successfully <laughs> around here. <laughs> I, I, and I simply would not want to place much confidence in my ability to get points across if I were de deprived of my clothes. Uh, it would seem a distraction to some students, at least, to be constantly reminded that their teacher's a nudist. <laughs> it's probably a distraction for students to be constantly reminded of any of their teacher's qualities that are not connected to the subject matter. But again, I'm placing myself in the position of the students. I should move on to the next point. I think you should know connections between your research and your teaching. I think it's very important to do research. I done, did not at first realize the importance to teaching uh, of research. I treated them as separate activities. But it takes only a little experience or a little observing to realize how they are connected and how they can complement each other. <laughs> 